Long Beach, California, and he switched the focus of his research, was, which was restoring the kelp forest. And he decided to pursue understanding the plastic that is accumulating in this particular area of the ocean, known as the garbage patch. It was essentially about Charlie. I, I hung with him. <laughs> He gave me a pretty good line too. He said, uh, "So what's the big deal? The ocean is going from smooth to extra chunky." <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk about what the, what's the big deal. And I'll just go over what I what I did, what I do, and what I found out. What I did was I built a boat. The boat was made out of aluminum, and the place to build a boat if you want a research vessel is Australia. If you want a catamaran research vessel on a short platform with a lot of working space. The first guy to do catamaran work boats was Lock Crowther of Crowther Designs over in Sydney, Australia. And I built it in Hobart because that was the best place to build it. And it came out pretty nice. I mean, uh, if you want to access remote parts of the ocean economically, you've got to sail there. You can't carry enough fuel to get out there. You've got to have a sail. And a catamaran is a fast sailing boat. And it just so happened that you know we broke the mast off coming back from American Samoa and had to refit it and I wanted to test it out. And that was the reason for entering this yacht rate. Right? And uh, you know, when we, when we put the boat away, we have to lower that, it has to go under that bridge right there. So that mast all has to come down. Every single time we go out, it takes about an hour, hour and a half to rig the thing for sea. When we've got it down, we're like Don Quixote tilting at windmills. It sticks out about 40 feet in front of the bow. <laughs> but when we get out there, when we get out in the middle of the ocean, we deploy a, uh, net, and we call this uh, manta trawl, and it's similar to a manta ray, which is an animal that uh, feeds on uh, small planktonic organisms that filters them out of the water. And this manta trawl is designed to catch uh, the same sort of uh, plankton that a manta ray would have. It's got these two wings you can see there, and a wide mouth. When you deploy it in the ocean, it looks like this, and it's pretty good in terms of uh, being able to capture whatever's on the surface because any wave that wants to break in front of it rather than breaking over it it's going to get caught by this hood right here and it only goes down about 20 centimeters under the water so it captures what we call the newston layer or the surface layer of the ocean the surface layer of the ocean is very important it's where a lot of the activity takes place and uh, that is the place where we were seeing this plastic debris so that's the area we wanted to sample when we pull the net in, we take the collection bag off the end and turn it inside out. It's like a sock. And then pull every particle we can find off of it, wash it off with a wash bottle, and put it into a Petri dish. And where we've done this is all these stations. Every one of these is a place where we've dropped that net into the ocean and sampled. The one uh, I just came back from October 6th, we went the farthest we've ever gone. Uh, the International Day Line. That's two-thirds of the way to Japan. That's where you cross it, you lose a day, or depending on which direction you're going, gain a day. And people are always asking me, well, where is this phenomenon? They, is it twice the size of Texas, or the size of the United States, or is it the size of Africa? How, where, where does it stop? Where does it start? And we try to answer that question. Uh, we've got a fairly decent idea that, you know, there's not much in this little zone right here. But after we get out about to here, and as far as we've ever gone, we haven't found an end to it. And what happens when we pull that net in, you know, is we are surprised by the amount of plastic we see. In fact, you can see even NOAA, the National Oceanographic Centralls, we're going to pull up and, you know, this is the clean part. This is the part that hasn't been affected yet. This is the part where it stops. But we never found it. Now, here's a... Uh, Valella Valella's cousin, the little button Valella, it's a jellyfish that lives on the surface of the ocean. Uh, here's more plankton than some of the other samples. You can see these amphipods and copepods turning the sample blue color. There's some more plankton mixed in with the plastic. Our initial survey in 1999 found six times as much plastic by weight as plankton. When we dry, separate this from the plankton and dry the plankton separately, uh, in 1999, we found there was six pounds of plastic for every pound of zooplankton. That's the animal plankton that feeds on the plant plankton. Uh, now we're starting to see a lot higher numbers. Uh, we find fishing line. Here's another partial bottle cap. 
more stuff. And then this one, you know, pretty plankton free, not a lot of plankton in this one. Uh, that Valella Valella is the, the one that we call the by the wind sailor. This uh, clear part of the animal is its sail and it, it sits above the water surface. And some of them are on the port tack, some are on the starboard tack, but they sail all over the ocean. There are uh, months of the year when you can find a lot of them on Pacific Coast beaches. Um, this is an oyster tube spacer. This is from the oyster farming industry, used to space the distance between uh, wrecks of oysters. And uh, this is a sample that has a lot of uh, Valella in it. Uh, these little by the wind sailors, a lot of plankton. But still, isn't this a disgusting plastic soup? I mean, this is food. This is food, and you're shopping for food if you're a fish out there, if you're a bird, if you're a turtle. This is your supermarket. Now, can you imagine going into the supermarket and six out of seven oranges was a nice plastic fake? I mean, you're going to make a mistake once in a while. It's not a pretty picture. We're finding ingestion to be a big part of the problem. Another oyster spacer. And of course, popsicle sticks. This is something I collect. I've decided, you know, I can't make a collection out of every kind of debris we find, but I, I like the popsicle sticks because it's so easy to fix and just go back to the wood popsicle stick. We never find little bits of wood out there. The, by the time any debris has made it out there, it will have biodegraded, if it's biodegradable. Uh, only big logs make it all the way out to the Central Pacific. Uh, but now we're finding popsicle sticks, umbrella handles, and toothbrushes. That's what I call it. Uh, this is one of the worst ones we ever got. And this is out, way outside that convergence zone. So talk a little bit more later on about why it's so difficult to characterize where this stuff is. This was one that uh, was not in that convergence zone. It was about 600 miles north of Kauai. And this is a night sample. You know, it makes a big difference whether you're pulling that net in day or night. Because at night, the largest daily migration of life on Earth occurs, and creatures which have hidden from predators during the day come to the surface to feed, and they feed frantically for the darkness, the period of darkness, and then descend again to the depths to hide. And these are actually very successful fish at doing that. They're called lanternfish. They have, if you look at them, they have like little lanterns on the side of them, uh, little headlamps, and they uh, uh, out way all other fish put together, including your swordfish, tuna, the sharks, everything else, they're less than half of the fish biomass in the ocean. These are greater than half the fish biomass of the ocean. Because why? The great ocean, the depths of the ocean, far out numbers the habitat that exists along the coastal zone where there's upwelling, where we see our sardines, our menhaden, our smelt, our anchovies, our herring, those fish that we associate with schooling and with big fish biomass, the base of the food chain here in the coastal waters, those are minuscule in, in comparison with the great deep ocean offshore, which is an average depth of two miles and has much more habitat. So just by being small and successful, just about as big as your finger, these fish uh, have succeeded in populating the entire deep ocean realm many, many different species of them, and uh, they do not school. They're not something you can go and throw a net around a whole big school of them. You just see one here and one there. That's because the ocean's so big, you know, they don't have to. 